I'm delighted to see all of you here. I'm Jan Moulton, president of Plato. I see many familiar faces in the audience. Good to see you. I also see a few new ones. I'm wondering if anybody who's here for the first time at a Plato colloquium would raise their hand just so I could know who you are. <laughs> Good your speaker. <laughs> okay, today our colloquium is about evidence-based medicine and how it can be particularly useful as a diagnostic tool. If you're at all like me, I would bet that you know at least one person who has gone from doctor to doctor trying to get a clear and accurate diagnosis of a physical problem or illness. We, we all know about that. So I'm looking forward to what our speaker has to say. Let's get on with today's program. I'd like to introduce Richard Adler, who is the colloquium chair this year. Thank you, Jen. We have um, one more colloquium left in our colloquium series this year. It'll be on May 18th, Thursday, May 18th. And a topic that I think is uh, getting deeper and more evolved every day. Um, media bias, real or imagined, in the age of Donald Trump. <laughs> I, I marvel at the newspaper every day. Uh, it's just a subject that's so fascinating. I, you know, Jan, we should have a colloquium, uh, not a colloquium, uh, an SDG on that. Uh, it's just so fascinating. Anyway, Dr. Scott Weingarten is married and has two children. He is the son of proud Plato members Myrna and Victor Weingarten, who are sitting in the back. If you could stand up, uh, Myrna and, and, and Vic. Thank you. According to Myrna, Scott's preparation for his medical career began when he was two years old. One of their neighbors, who she identifies, by the way, as Midge Bailey, found Scott to be a warm and friendly little guy. She said to the two-year-old Scott, you will make a good baby doctor. Scott replied, I have to wait until I grow up. <laughs> and here he is, he's, he's now grown up, grown up. Now if you look at his resume, which is posted on the Cedar sinai website, you will find out that he is an MD and also an MPH. I googled the initials MPH because I thought MPH stood for miles per hour. <laughs> so like a fast doctor or something. Mm. Turns out it means that Scott is a doctor of medicine with a master's degree in, you guessed it, public health. Dr. Weingarten is also a senior vice president and chief clinical transformation officer at Cedar sinai I will get back to the transformation officer part of it in a moment. He is a professor of medicine at Cedar sinai and a clinical professor of medicine at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. He is a board, certified, a board certified in internal medicine and a fellow of the American College of Physicians. Dr. Weingarten has published over 100 articles and editorials on healthcare quality improvement, clinical decision support, and related topics. He has authored numerous chapters on improving the quality of patient care in some of the leading internal medicine textbooks. He has given more than 300 presentations on clinical decision support and related topics throughout the United States and internationally. Dr. Weingarten has held positions on a myriad of na national medical committees. I won't go into all of them. At Cedar sinai he has been awarded both the President's Award and the Golden Apple Teaching Award and was alumnus of the year for 2009. Um, I, could, I could say that Dr. Weingarten is among the few doctors I ever met that has an entrepreneurial side as well. Uh, he is the co-founder, president, and chief executive officer of, how do you pronounce that again? Zinks. Zinks. Z-Y-N-X. Zinks Health. 
which is the leader for care plans for electronic health records. Scott sold uh, Zinx Health to the Center Corporation and later to the Hearst Corporation. He also is a co-inventor of three software patents. I did make some efforts to understand what evidence-based medicine means. In a nutshell, I think it means big data comes to transform healthcare in a similar way to how big data has transformed the law, politics, advertising, and most powerfully today, search engines. So here we have algorithms meeting medical reports and medical test data. I came across a book written by Michael Millinson, who was a healthcare reporter for the Chicago Tribune. He was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. Millinson spent 15 years researching and writing about doctors involved in evidence-based medicine. Millinson's book has an impressive title, Demanding Medical Excellence, Doctors and Accountability in the Information Age. Scott Weingarten is one of the heroes of this book, as well as in the world of evidence-based medicine. He is described this way in Mr. Millinson's book, quote, Dr. Weingarten has emerged as one of the nation's most astute developers of practice guidelines that point physicians in the same direction as the best medical evidence. It is hard, not very glamorous work. However, well-conceived guidelines can reduce unnecessary care, cut medical costs, and with a nearly complete lack of drama, save lives, end quote. Millison explains that in, in the late 1980s, Cedars dabbled in putting out guidelines based on physician consensus. The predictable result was the kind of vague conglomerations common to political parties, platforms, and corporate mission statements. In mid-1991, Cedars recruited Scott to freshen their approach to writing these guidelines. Scott was recruited because he has the credibility of a practicing doctor with an impressive academic credentials, and he understood the theoretical basis for getting physicians to change their behavior. At Cedars, Scott instituted the use of computerized databases to reduce labor cost. According to Millinson, as, a reason, as reasonable as using computer databases sounded, achieving consensus in a profession that trains practitioners to trust their own intuition was, as is often quoted expression put it, like herding cats. Scott has been described in a criminology publication. Um, I sort of hesitated in criminology, but it's in a field that I know well, so these people, Scott, know evidence pretty well. So I think it's a compliment that they like you in criminology. Uh, they call, the criminologists call Scott Cedar's evidence cop in residence. His job is to monitor what the 2,250 doctors are doing to patients at the hospital and to detect practices that run counter to recommendations based on research evidence. And Scott does this through prodding rather than punishment. Con he convenes groups of doctors who treat specific maladies to discuss the research evidence. Scott says these doctors that resist the process say the guidelines are like cookbook medicine. As a Superior Court judge for 32, 32 years, I too know what it's like to try to get a large bureaucracy and 500 judges to change their ways. Once a consensus opinion forms, let's call it groupthink, only massive evidence can change their views. Judges had used photocopied jury instructions or printed jury instructions with scratch outs and handwritten insertions for at least a half a century. I developed a computer program to print and edit these instructions. And although the computer, computer program is still sold today by Thomson Reuters, if I look in the mirror long enough, I can still see the wheel marks where the consensus bureaucrats rolled right over me. So I appreciate what Scott is doing. 
And so without further ado, Scott Weingarten has a distinguished career and we are honored to have him with us today. Oh, what, one further word, one, I gotta say this, one further word about the questions. With a show of hands, how many of you have been a patient at Cedar sinai Aha, oh. okay, I know that when we get to the question and answer period, you're gonna wanna get in all these personal details um, I think it's okay, but try to keep it to a minimum and because we, we need to get all everybody to ask questions. Uh, my own personal experience, I love the waiting room on the plaza level with the lady that plays the, the, the piano. So I, I told him that already. So that's, that was my little personal thing I wanted to get in there. All right, Scott. Great. You're right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very, very much, Richard, for that extremely thoughtful and kind introduction. Uh, when I hear it, I almost wish my parents were in the room to hear it. And Oh my gosh, there they are. So um, it is really an honor and, and a privilege to be here with you this afternoon. I think uh, Plato is one of the organizations that I respect the most. I know we have the best and the brightest uh, people in Southern California here. And uh, so I've been looking forward to this for quite a while. So I'd like to share with you some information about healthcare for some background information, and then we'll dig right in and talk about evidence-based medicine and computerized clinical decision support, and look forward to hearing your comments and thoughts during the question and answer period. So healthcare, um, you, you see here on the y-axis, but healthcare, this is rising healthcare costs, and this is the United States. In the United States, healthcare costs consume 17% of the gross domestic product, and we spend significantly more on healthcare than other industrialized countries listed here. And you can see a rising rate of healthcare costs over the last uh, few decades. And some people postulate that if healthcare costs continues with their current ascent, one day, theoretically, healthcare could consume 100% of the GDP. And of course, that's not possible. We still want infrastructure and roads and schools and, and so on. But healthcare costs are rising dramatically. And, and why is that? Why are healthcare costs rising? at the rate that they are. And you can see, compared to other countries, the United States down here, down below, compared to Australia, Canada, Denmark, et cetera, we do more MRI exams. We do more MRI exams than other countries uh, per thousand people in the population. We do more CT scans than other countries. So a number more CT scans. And we do a lot of PET scans. It turns out for some reason, unbeknownst to me, Denmark really likes doing PET scans, but we are almost up there with them. So we do more scans than other countries, diagnostic imaging. And we prescribe more medications than other countries. So here you see the United States in terms of number of prescription drugs taken regularly for people who are adults. And you can see we prescribe more. We're right there with New Zealand down here, uh, but you can see we prescribe a lot more medications than other industrialized countries. And, and, and that's all good. I mean, healthcare, we value healthcare. In, in healthcare, uh, we perform miracles, we save lives, we improve people's quality of life. But when we compare ourselves to other countries where we spend less, um, we find some interesting results and, and perhaps even concerning results and will challenge us. Can we do better? Can we do better? And what do I mean by this? If you look at our life expectancy at birth, 78 years, but look at all the other countries, Australia, Canada, France, Germany. In fact, we do worse than all the other countries. Why is that? Infant mortality. We're higher infant mortality than all of the other countries. This doesn't make any sense, does it? We spend more. But in many ways, if we look at patient outcomes, we get less. How could that be? Percentage of the population over the age of 65 with two or more chronic conditions. Again, we have significantly more people with two or more chronic conditions. We can do better. Obesity rates, and this is partially explanatory, we are more obese than, than other countries. Uh, it turns out we have fewer smokers and we have fewer people over the age of 65. So if you look at value, we spend more 
But then if you look at outcomes, what are the benefits so far in the United States they're not as good as other countries. So, uh, you know, we'll talk a little bit, how can we do better? What approaches should we take to make sure this expenditure leads to the best results for the American people? And there are a lot of reasons for this. And we could spend an hour talking about all the different reasons. But one thing we do here is we spend more on medical care and we spend less on social care. Isn't that fascinating? Take a look at that. So other countries spend more in social care than us, 9%, and they have better outcomes. So for the investment we make in healthcare, how can we ensure that the American people derive the greatest possible benefit? And that's what we're gonna spend our time talking about today. Sound okay? Yes. All right. So let's talk about the American healthcare system. Before I do, I'd like to share with you a bridge. Does anybody recognize this bridge? No. Anybody here been to Honduras? <laughs> You've been to Honduras, you recognize the bridge. No? Uh, no, okay. So, um, no guesses, huh? All right. So this, I'll give you a hint, it, the bridge it is over the Choloteca River. <laughs> Choloteca Bridge, okay. So back in the 1930s, the government of Honduras wanted to build a state-of-the-art bridge, okay. There wasn't that much automobile traffic, and so not that many people wanted to go back and forth over the Choloteca River, but they were visionary, and they, they, they saw a day when one day people would want to go back and forth, and they called in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and they wanted to build a state-of-the-art bridge, use civil engineering, probably uh, my father is a uh, civil engineer by background, and really best structural design, and they built the Choloteca Bridge, and at the time it was really considered a marvel. It was considered a marvel. Anybody know what happened in Honduras back in 1998? Any guesses? Earthquake. Earthquake. Good guess. Good guess. Not that particular year. <laughs> any, any, or there might have been, but a uh, different story for a different day. Um, any other guesses? Hurricane. Who said that? Hurricane. You're absolutely right. Hurricane Mitch. Hurricane Mitch had 180 mile an hour winds. Fifth largest hurricane at that time uh, ever uh, that uh, came from the, the Atlantic Ocean. And everyone went to bed that night. Everyone went to bed that night. And they woke up and, 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 and they surveyed the bridges. You know, what was the damage? This huge monster uh, hurricane, what damage did it cause? How did the Choloteca Bridge do? It did okay, it did well. It really was an engineering marvel. But when they woke up, they inspected the bridges. Many of the bridges had significant damage. And here the Choloteca Bridge was left standing. <laughs> left standing. But the problem was, it moved the river. <laughs> it moved the river. No one saw that coming. This hurricane moved the river. This is truly a bridge from nowhere to nowhere. <laughs> Okay. River was here you, the day before. You wake up the next day, the river's over here. How'd that happen? How'd that happen? And in healthcare, healthcare is changing dramatically. And I'm not really going to talk about the financing of healthcare. You read about that every day in the news. But really talking about the delivery of healthcare and evidence based medicine and clinical decision support. And we're moving from a system of delivering care where the more we do in healthcare, the more we get paid, what's called fee for volume, to fee for value, where you get paid more if you deliver better results. You have lower mortality rates, lower morbidity rates, patients have better quality of life. So in healthcare, when I share this slide with my doctor friends and colleagues, it's really the rivers moved on us, the environment has moved, and we need to adapt. And this is really causing a lot of disruptive innovation. Like you see in other industries, we're seeing healthcare being disrupted, I believe over the long term in a positive way that'll lead to lower mortality, lower morbidity, better quality of life for all of us. But there will be winners in healthcare and losers in healthcare. So here we have Yellow Taxi. Who's disrupting Yellow Taxi? Uber, Uber they sure are, aren't they? 
Um, Kodak, Remember Kodak, great company. Yeah, Kodak, connected digital photography. And it turns out actually Kodak had one of the original um, patents on digital imaging. They didn't capitalize it and they've been disrupted. Anybody here remember Blockbuster Video? Yeah. I remember Blockbuster Video. In fact, what you may not know is there was once a, a, a blockbuster bowl game, college bowl game. Imagine that, one day you have a college bowl game and the next day you're, you're, you're out of business. In fact, the blockbuster video in my hometown of Agura is now a great frozen yogurt shop. So disruptive innovation is occurring in all industries and it's occurring in healthcare as well. And you know, these are a list of 50 things that have been displaced. Uh, or will be displaced uh, by your smartphone. By your smartphone. Wow, isn't that something? Now this list is 50. What do you think the list will look like in three years, five years, 100, 200? It's gonna be a longer list, isn't it? So anybody know who this guy is? Who, I'm sorry? Hilton. You're absolutely right. His first name? Conrad. Conrad, you guys are good. It's a, it's a sharp group. This is Conrad Hilton. And Conrad Hilton was on The Tonight Show. Anybody remember Johnny Carson? And he interviewed Conrad Hilton, and um, good interview. And then at the end of the interview, Johnny Carson leaned over to Conrad Hilton and said, you have a lot of America watching you now. A lot of America watching you. What's the one thing you want to leave them with? What's, what's, your, what's your message? What do you want to leave them with? And Conrad Hilton, he, he thought about it. He said, I know, I know. When you stay in one of my hotels, make sure the shower curtain is on the inside of the tub rather than the outside of the tub. And that was the end of the interview. Clear, simple message. And what I'm gonna share with you now, we talk a little bit about evidence-based medicine that by physicians and nurses and pharmacists, decisions being informed by the best available evidence, what the science would suggest will, will lead to the lowest mortality rates, the best outcomes for patients, and providing that to clinicians at the point of care while they're caring for patients. They have great opportunity to prove the, improve the quality of care and safely reduce the cost of care. Okay, we can significantly improve healthcare in the United States and beyond. And that's my Conrad Hilton message. So let me share with you, and again, thank you so much for that extremely thoughtful introduction, Richard. Um, uh, a story from way back when, in 1992, when I started at Cedar sinai And uh, I was asked to participate on a team that was trying to standardize care for the post-operative management of children with congenital heart disease, what's called tetralogy of flow and atrial septal defect. And we convened a group of cardiac surgeons and pediatric cardiologists and anesthesiologists and pediatricians and nurses and respiratory therapists. And we, we wanted to standardize care, to try and agree what, what we thought was the best practice and make sure all doctors did that to the best of our ability within Cedar sinai Makes sense, doesn't it? No? Okay, stay tuned. So this was expert practice and we created what we call a clinical pathway or a clinical approach. And we all agreed on it and I felt good. You know, you go to a meeting and I think to Richard's points earlier, sometimes you go to meetings and you know, you can have or, you know, it can be bureaucratic and, and I, we all agreed. Now it's a great thing, right? Doctors and nurses. And uh, I went out to dinner with my, my wife that night and we went to a Chinese restaurant. I was feeling good about the day. And this was my fortune in my fortune cookie. <laughs> Honest, honest to God, true story. This is my fortune. So you crack, we've all done that, right? You crack open, you have a good meal, you crack open your fortune cookie, you look at your fortune, I know you all look at your fortunes as well. Your judgment is a little off at this time. That's concerning, because you don't know how your judgment is off or why it's off. And, and so, and I didn't know, I didn't know. But I kept the fortune because I thought, there's something my judgment's a little bit off on. And then we decided to do a literature review. 
on the use of respiratory therapy, which we all agreed was the appropriate thing to do for children recovering after congenital heart surgery. So we did a literature review. We reviewed the available scientific evidence. And we found a study where they randomized children recovering after cardiac surgery, similar cardiac surgery, they randomized them to receive respiratory therapy and no respiratory therapy. Imagine that. Normally you think of, you get randomized to drug A or drug B. Isn't that something? Respiratory therapy, no respiratory therapy. Respiratory therapy, you all know, can be people kind of patting your back or vibrating the little device on your back. And in this randomized controlled clinical trial, what did they find? They found that chest physiotherapy was associated with more frequent and more severe lung collapse. More frequent and severe lung collapse. That's not good for these children. And then a nurse who had been silent, actually um, a lot of the doctors had been most vocal in the earlier meetings, and a nurse raised her hand and said, you know what, I, I really don't want to speak up before, but you know these children, they have these big midline incisions. Imagine a two-year-old, three-year-old, big midline incision, and you vibrate their back. That's got to hurt, right? That's got to hurt like heck. And the children all cry. And then imagine the mom and the dad there with their child who's just gone through this cardiac surgery, a two, poor two-year-old, a three-year-old, seeing their kid crying. So let's think about it here. What is it doing? It's causing more frequent and severe lung collapse. It's inflicting pain upon the child. It's distressing their parents to see the child in additional pain. And it's costing money because you're paying the respiratory therapist. So we went back to the group and said, I know we felt good about standardizing care and we thought respiratory therapy was the right way to go, but what do we all think about this randomized controlled clinical trial? So we shouldn't do it. We should not do it. We should all agree not to do respiratory therapy. So this is evidence-based medicine. This bird has figured out the earlier the bird rises, the more worms the bird gets to eat. This is not a randomized controlled clinical trial, but one form of evidence-based decision-making, if you would. Simple things, the ringing in your ears, I think I can help. <laughs> to, to more complicated things, as we'll talk about later. So, we, there's a lot in the news about healthcare costs, uh, a lot in the news uh, about uh, healthcare costs. And so we're trying to improve quality, trying to reduce mortality, reduce morbidity, improve quality of life, cure cancer. But at the same time, we don't have an infinite budget. And uh, healthcare costs are a real concern for the American people. I just read a survey that was taken out of Monmouth uh, University, it was published, you can Google it, in January of this year, which said the American people, in terms of concerns for their family, were more concerned about health care costs than jobs, immigration, terrorism, or crime combined. Combined, imagine that. Who would have thought? So when you survey the American people, they're concerned about that. A significant percentage of personal bankruptcies are because of health care costs. So there have been studies, scientific studies in the Journal of the American Medical Association where they've looked at things that we do to patients that may not improve care. Waste. What does waste mean? We do something, no, no, no benefit to the patient. And then they talk about overtreatment. Overtreatment is subjecting patients to care that according to sound science and the patient's own preferences cannot possibly help them. Cannot possibly help them. We don't want to do that. I don't want that for me. I don't want that for my family. I don't want that for you. And if you look at waste, that's 910 billion per year. And overtreatment where the harm may exceed the benefits, 10% of healthcare. 158 to 226 billion per year. So if we can reduce overtreatment where the harm exceeds the benefits and waste, could that lead to more funding for care that will help the American people and improve our outcomes? 
and, and lower our infant mortality rate. And that's really the question in front of us. Now, as we think about that, there are a lot of different sources of information out there. So when I was trained in medical school, it, it, was, it was really a badge of honor how much I could memorize. How much I could memorize. So the, the way it worked on rounds would be you would admit a patient with some rare condition, it, it, Cedar sinai hemolytic uremic syndrome, which you didn't know that much about, and you would read up on it at 3 a.m., and then the next morning the attending physician would quiz you or grill you, do you know the latest seven treatments for hemolytic uremic syndrome? And you were up all night and you do your best and you commit it all to memory. But healthcare is changing. This is where computers and decision support is helpful because none of us can remember all of this. In, in part, the, the volume and the velocity of medical information is increasing so rapidly, there's no person on the planet who can remember this. We spend $32 billion per year, which is greater than $32 billion now for NIH research. Um, a lot of research and our output for the deliverables of this investment we choose to make as Americans are peer-reviewed journal articles, scientific articles that might teach us the best way to treat patients with congestive heart failure. But the issue is there are 20,000 biomedical journals, 6,000 articles published every day, one article every 26 seconds. One article every 26 seconds. Who could remember and retain the information in one article that's published every 26 seconds? It's been said by the end of the decade, the doubling time for medical information may be three and a half years, meaning medical information may double the amount of information in three and a half years. Wow. It's been said, I don't know whether this is true or not, that the human brain, we can read and retain about 200 megabytes worth of information. Actually, I read that somewhere. I have no idea how you could scientifically prove or disprove that, but let's go with it for a second. And um, computers are better at reading and retaining information. So, you know, think about this information. We also have to store other things in, in, in our brains. Or, you know, maybe I gotta remember my wife's birthday. Uh, I gotta remember my address, my phone number. So lots of information in addition to medical information. Now, it's been said that, that the, um, if a physician, a medical resident, finished residency and knew absolutely everything. Absolutely everything. That person does not exist. That doesn't exist. It's impossible. Perfect board scores. And read and retained the information in two articles every single night. At the end of one year, that physician would be 1,225 years behind the world's literature. <laughs> We can't read and retain that kind of information. That's where information technology and computers come in handy. Um, let me tell you something I did, uh, and I almost got myself in trouble, at the American College of Chess Physicians meeting. So it's a large meeting, maybe four or 500 people in the audience. And um, I was trying to make a point about how we need information technology and computers to help us remember. So I said, which can spur the moment, probably a dumb thing, but bear with me for a second. There were American Thoracic Society guidelines for the treatment of patients with pneumonia. And there was a specific guideline, and I knew they were all pulmonologists, and I knew they all treated patients with pneumonia for a living. And I named a guideline, I said, anybody familiar with that guideline? And they, basically all the hands went up. They're again all pulmonologists, they treat patients with pneumonia. And I said, if anybody can recite it, in the next minute, in the next minute, um, without looking at your phone, without looking at your phone, I will send you and a significant other on vacation anywhere in the United States for a week on me. And I took out my credit card. Could anybody do it? No. So thankfully, the answer was no. Boy, I would have been in big trouble with my wife if I had explained, yeah, I went to this conference and we're sending Dr. Smith and uh, her husband to Hawaii on vacation because I did something dumb in front of a lot of people. But no one could do it. And then someone came up to me afterwards and said, Dr. Weingarten, were you trying to embarrass people? 
And I said, no, not at all. I, I knew the guideline was complicated. I can't remember it. I, I think I read it right before this lecture. I wouldn't expect any of them to remember it either. And they said, well, you know the developers of the guideline were in the audience, don't you? I said, I didn't know that, but I'm not surprised they didn't remember it either. <laughs> so the, the other part, how many of you have heard of precision medicine? So precision medicine is, has to do with your genetic makeup, Okay, your genetic makeup, and it could be proteomics, it could have to do with your microbiome or your bacteria in your gut. And so we may do a genetic analysis on me, and we could do a genetic analysis on you, and we're going to have differences, we're going to have similarities and differences. And if I develop hypertension, there may be a drug that's more effective and safer for me, and if you develop hypertension, it might be a different drug uh, for you. So. Everyone has a genetic profile. This will be used to determine treatments and prognosis in the future. And, and so no one's going to remember this. Uh, be, and there's no physician alive who's going to be able to remember, oh, you have this particular genetic profile, therefore an ACE inhibitor is the proper drug for you with hypertension. And nobody's going to be able to do that. It's getting less expensive. Anybody done genetic testing on their dog? <laughs> no? I'm the only one? <laughs> okay, so I'll let you in a little secret. How many of you have dogs? This is actually really fun. This is fun. So you, on Amazon, you can do genetic testing on your dog. Uh, it's about $80, okay? And can I trust all of you? I found out something scandalous. Can I trust you guys all okay? What's said in this room stays in this room, okay? So we thought our dog was a Labradoodle. Maggie the Labradoodle. We did. We thought that for eight years. We did. We found out she's one-eighth golden retriever. We don't know how it happened. We don't know. She doesn't know. But we're convinced based on her genetic testing. The other thing we found out, she does not have an MDR1 gene, which means there are a lot of drugs we can safely give her. We, we don't want to give her drugs, but in case we did, we know she's not going to have uh, adverse drug reaction, and we know she's unlikely to develop ulcerative colitis, which is good news. <laughs> so there's a lot of information out there. There's evidence, there's patient information, and Richard mentioned big data. So let me share with you a story about big data that was published in the New York Times. And Basically what happened was uh, there was a 16-year-old girl and she lived with her father and um, Target kept sending her um, uh, advertisements for diapers and baby products and her dad didn't get it and he got angry. He was upset and he called the manager at Target and said, what are you trying to do? What are you trying to do? Promote teenage pregnancy? My daughter is 16. You're sending her advertisements, ads, for diapers. That's ridiculous. Get a hold of yourself. And the manager said, I'm so sorry. And he said, I will look into it. I don't, I don't know why. You know, we make some mistakes sometimes. And then the father called the manager back and said, wow, you guys knew my daughter was pregnant, Target, before I did. <laughs> No apology is needed. And so this is big data. So it turns out some really smart person in the basement did algorithms and did multiple regression analyses and these fancy, super fancy correlations and figured out through their database that women of a certain age, you know, including 16 year olds, who purchase unscented lotions and soaps and certain calcium, certain mineral supplements, if you fast forward six months, nine months, they're buying diapers. So they did the correlation and they said, apparently there's tremendous value in capturing a, a baby, a client, and getting them to use your diapers. So there, there's significant monetary value. So somebody really smart said, if we know they're about to have a baby, then let's send the advertisements. And they didn't do it, most people thought, based on pregnancy tests. So the, this is a fun article if any of you are interested, how Target figured out a teen girl was pregnant before her father did. But it shows you different sources of data, big data. You, we all go to the doctor. A lot of data can be used to derive correlations. So let's fast forward to today and we have electronic health records 
in, in our physician offices and virtually all hospitals across the United States. Uh, there's possibly some benefit. I, I think some of you may have experienced um, in some situations where doctors maybe are spending a little bit too much time on the computer and not enough time listening. But in addition, there can be some benefits. So this is a result of the federal government investing $36 billion for doctors and hospitals to purchase electronic health records. And you all had a presentation on the self-driving car, is that right? Pretty good presentation? Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about self-driving car as it might relate to healthcare. So as you all could teach me from the presentation, is self-driving cars are here today, and in the not so distant future, I, it's likely we're all gonna be using them. In fact, it's been predicted that children born today may only drive a car in places like Disneyland in the future. And, and they forecasted that once the market is mature in self-driving cars, that it may reduce automobile fatalities by up to 90% because a lot of fatalities are from human error. And so what are self-driving cars? And if I get this wrong or it contradicts anything you heard in the recent lecture, please let me know during the question and answer period. But they are really decision support um, it's really decision support because self-driving cars have various sensors and they can detect here's another car over here, here's a car over there, there's a stoplight, it's red, um, the, the, the road is icy, there's a dog that just ran in the street, maybe even a ball is bouncing in the street and a child might follow the ball. And it, in real time, the, the information's processed, big data, and the car turns left, right, accelerates or brakes. So self-driving cars are really decision support technology. Sound, make sense? And this is a very complicated slide, but they found that if you provide context-specific information to physicians, let's say I'm being treated by a physician, information about me. Let's say I have diabetes and I have asthma. Information that's relevant to me, maybe with my genetic profile is 112 times more likely to improve care than if you don't do that. 112 times more likely. Think about it, that's from information, 112 times more likely. If we discovered a drug for heart failure that was 112 times more effective at saving lives and was affordable and safe, that drug would be a blockbuster, right? Let me give you an example of a, a patient I saw and a number of other uh, patient, another a number of other physicians saw. So there was a 53-year-old marathon runner, and uh, she actually the, Mar the LA Marathon Sunday, right? So she would train each year, six months, nine months, uh, for the LA Marathon, and um, and then she would see me or other doctors more commonly, uh, often for overuse injuries, knee pain you know, an ankle sprain. And so everybody treated her, but, but at the time, no one, you know, brought her back. You know, she was a very healthy woman for a physical exam. And when she was finally brought back for a physical exam, she had a mammogram which showed early stage breast cancer. And she hadn't had a mammogram for three years. Now, good news, it, it was caught, it was curable, and she was cured, and I hope I, I don't know for a fact, but I hope she's running the LA Marathon on Sunday. But um, had a little reminder popped up, popped up, saying this patient's overdue for a mammogram, then much more likely the patient would have had an earlier mammogram. So this is information in the workflow. Nurse, get on the internet, go to surgery.com, scroll down and click on the are you totally lost icon. <laughs> so information provided to physicians, evidence-based information. So I'd like to share with you um, an initiative at Cedars-Sinai that at, at Cedars-Sinai we're very proud of. There, there's um, a, the American Board of Internal Medicine got together with about 60, 70 now physician societies. Uh, representing at this point close to 600,000 physicians, such as the American College of Cardiology. And they define what works, what will improve care, and what won't work where the harm exceeds the benefits. And at Cedar sinai we hardwired that into the electronic health record to remind physicians in real time 
when they're doing something that might conflict with these recommendations. And so we hardwired a number of recommendations in. So the way it might look is this. So uh, let's say we have a 80-year-old patient who comes in and says, I, I have insomnia. I can't sleep. And let's say the physician reached for what's called a benzodiazepine, Val Valium, Ativan, Ambien. And this would pop up and say it's not recommended by the American Geriatric Society and you can link, you can look at the information, the science behind that. And if you did, you would find that for elderly people it increases the risk of falling, hip fracture, motor vehicle accidents, and death. So that's a conversation that should be had between the physician and the patient. Now, what, what often ha happens in these situations, the patient says, okay, I, I, I certainly don't want a hip fracture, but I still can't sleep, what do I do? And that's a good question and that's an important question. And Consumer Reports has information for patients about what they can do instead. Sleep hygiene that's safer. So this will pop up every time at Cedar sign This is just one example, about 100 examples. And we found that when we did this with physicians, that it improved care. You know, don't use antipsychotics as first choice to treat symptoms of dementia. It actually can cause serious harm, including stroke and premature death. As soon as you pop it up, 18% reduction. We talked about benzodiazepines, opioids, opioid crisis across the United States right now. A lot of deaths, young people dying who shouldn't be dying from opioids. Don't do this, it can cause, uh, if it's, unless it's absolutely necessary, and all kinds of things like this. So we, we actually then looked at the clinical epidemiology literature and we, we, we found a significant reduction in benzodiazepine use. Again, Ativan, Valium, Ambien, as you commonly know these drugs. And we forecasted that in our population, as a result of the, just the information, little reminders, we believe that result in 22 fewer fall-related injuries, six fewer ED emergency department visits, three fewer hospitalizations, and two fewer deaths. That's just one of a hundred. So what's important, we're talking about ways of redesigning the American healthcare system. How can we improve quality of care? and at the same time reduce costs. So let's think about it. If we reduce falls and deaths, we've improved quality of care, right? And hip fractures, or, you know, or hospitalizations from falls, nobody wants to be in the hospital from a fall. Okay, we reduce costs at the same time. And you find interesting patterns. So this is actually, again, I, I trust all of you not to leave this room. I can still trust you? Okay, thank you. Good. So this is um, one of our uh, physicians, and we found that he did a lot of Lyme disease titers uh, on, um, on his patients, six in a three-day period, six patients. Okay, one of our physicians at Cedar Center. What's wrong with that? Yeah, we, we, we have very few cases of confirmed Lyme disease in, in L.A. Or LA County. In fact, when I looked a few years ago, there was one confirmed case, and confirmed is the operative word, there's suspected case, but one confirmed case in all of LA County for people who stayed in Southern California, didn't go to areas where Lyme disease was endemic, the Midwest, the Northeast. So one out of how many people live in LA County? <laughs> 10 million. So we, we, we talked to this physician and we said, chances one out of 10 million, you, you know you're more likely to get bit by a shark in LA County? <laughs> you're more likely uh, to get struck by lightning in LA County? Um, actually it turns out you are far, far more likely to be injured by a vending machine. It's true, it's kind of, you have to be careful out there. You, we've all been there, right? You put the money in, the candy bar does not fall. You're upset, you stick your arm in, and uh, nothing good can happen from that, <laughs> nothing good. And so we provided this information and the physician Stop doing it. The other thing is you, how many of you have uploaded your information such as heart rate and blood pressure to your physician? So this can be very helpful 
but you have to know, and we're just beginning to learn what it all means. So we did this at Cedar sinai and we found 2,000 patients who had over 200 beats per minute. And so, what does that mean? Oh my gosh. Is it a device error? Which it's going to be most commonly. Is it something you need to worry about? Is it a serious problem? You know, did the person watch a horror movie before bed and have a nightmare at 3 a.m.? You know, so this is a whole new world where patient reported physiological data. And then what do you do with that? So it's been found that if we put monitors on all of us, all of us who don't have any heart disease, 11% of us will have an atrial arrhythmia called atrial fibrillation. It's true. Healthy people. But the problem is, if you diagnose it, there's some studies for certain patients who are asymptomatic, if you treat them with antiarrhythmics, you can increase their mortality, cardiac mortality. So it's key, we have more and more information available to us, but how do we properly use this information? Let me tell you about one other device, and, and, and I'm proud to say this was invented by uh, um, actually a friend of mine at, at Cedar sinai How many of you have heard of the Swan-Gans catheter? Uh, pulmonary artery catheter. So what he did, what they did, is they invented an implantable pulmonary artery catheter. And, and this is the device. And um, what happens is you walk around with the device. The signal is transmitted uh, wirelessly uh, to a central database. And you can determine when your heart pressure goes up. Now what happens is, so take this guy right here. He's having a good old time at a barbecue with his grandkids and his kids, and he has mild heart failure. And maybe, you know, he's, he's there, it's a Sunday afternoon, it's all good. And then all of a sudden he gets a call from a nurse. And she said, you know, Mr. Jones, your pulmonary artery pressure is 19. It was 12 this morning. Did you take your medications today? Uh, of course, I, I did take my medications. Absolutely, I always take my medications. Did you eat anything different? Well, you know, we're having some barbecue and it's all good. Did you salt the barbecue? Well, yeah, the, you know, the grandkids, they always like it that way. And then, so Mr. Jones, go take the medication Lasix right now, because if you don't, you may end up in the hospital later that day. So it's all good. I mean, it's good. Preventive. And Mr. Jones doesn't want to be in the hospital. He wants to be with his kids and grandkids, right? So how many of you buy stuff on Amazon? Okay. So this, so, you know, in the future, this will look familiar. You'll see doctors with information, you know, patients like this who prescribe this antibiotic, maybe this antibiotic will work as well. Or the quality measures show that for patients with community-acquired pneumonia and this genetic profile, you should consider this type of antibiotic. Or Alexa. Any of you have Alexa in your house? From You do. Okay, few people. Um, again, from Amazon, where you voice recognition. So in the future, you have doctors say, you know, I'm here with Mrs. Smith. She's got diabetes and hypertension. What do I do? And the Alexa equivalent will say, of course, you do this, you do that. And she has this genetic profile, you should consider this. And she has a microbiome profile, bacteria in her gut, you should do that. So this is the future. Now, really cool article published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And it was entitled, The Next 100 Years of Medicine. That's, that's a cool article, right? I, I, you guys, you want to know what's going to happen the next, I want to know what's going to happen the next 100 years. Why not? And what they said in the article, complex but empirically validated algorithms will be embedded in electronic health record systems as decision support tools to assist in everyday patient care. These management algorithms will evolve and be modified continuously in accordance with inputs from ongoing clinical observations and from new research. Does this sound like it'll lead to better care? Sure does. Lower mortality rates, lower morbidity rates, better quality of life, less costly care. I think it will. I think it's really exciting. Now, there's a guy named Vinod Kosla. Anybody know that name? Yes, you do. Okay, so he's the founder of Sun Computers, now has a big venture fund. And he's written a lot. He's a technology person but he's written a lot on healthcare and decision support. And this is controversial. I do not show this 
slide to my doctor friends. So again, yeah, I, I can trust you. I didn't show this slide. My doctor friends get a little agitated when they see it. But um, it is inevitable that in the future, the majority of physician doctors internist time spent on medicine will be replaced by smart hardware, software, and testing. This is not to say that 80% of physicians will be replaced, but 80% of what they currently do might be replaced. So the roles of doctors and interns play will likely be different and focus on the human aspects of medical practice, such as empathy and bioethical choices. I don't know whether this is true or not. I, I don't know. But certainly, uh, you know, rather than looking up information and processing information, computers are really good at that. And, 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 and I believe medicine is a extremely honorable and noble profession. Well, you know, what kind of opportunity can, you know, save lives, make people feel better? And, but part of medicine is really holding somebody's hand when they're scared, the vulnerable, the elderly. And if you had more time, not only to, to diagnose the patient, treat the patient, but listen to the patient, process the information, answer questions. That strikes me as a good thing. So less time looking things up and more time talking to patients. I think it's good for the profession of medicine and I think it's good for um, patient care. So th there's a lot of information on preventable deaths and we talked about overtreatment, and it's still occurring, according to a study in the British Medical Journal and the Journal of the American Medical Association. During our time together today, if you look at across the United States, there may be 30 preventable deaths and over $20 million in overtreatment. So we can clearly do better. Now, health systems are changing. I shared at the beginning, you know, there was Yellow Cab and Uber and Blockbuster and Netflix. And this applies to healthcare. Anybody know who this guy is? Yeah, it sure is, Charles Drogon. It's not the strongest of species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survives. It is the one the most adaptable to change. I think in healthcare, the same applies. This isn't easy. Anybody know who this guy is? A movie? League of Their Own. League of Their Own, that's right. So as I share with my, my doctor friend, this, this is, it's, it's really, I mean, this is really a lot of fun, but it's hard to do the things that we're talking about. He said, of course it's hard. It's supposed to be hard. If it were easy, everybody would do it. Hard is what makes it great. To be able to process information real time, deliver the best quality of care to each and every one of your patients, and the best value of care, most affordable care, and, and spend time with the patients, listening to their questions, understanding their concerns, and responding to them. It, this is hard, but I think technology, uh, doctors working with this kind of technology, um, I, think, I, I think it's achievable. I think it's highly achievable, and achievable in the short term. And my last slide before questions and answers, Anybody know who this guy is? Any football fans here? Who's a football fan? Any UCLA football fans here? Okay, you are. Okay. Uh, anybody know the, the NFL team? Seahawks, all right. Good, it's Seattle Seahawks. And um, this is uh, uh, Derek uh, Coleman. De yes, Derek Coleman. And um, he played for the Seahawks. And um, Derek Coleman is deaf. And so um, when uh, Derek Coleman was in high school, they said, you can't play football, you're deaf. So you know, you think about it, he's an offensive player. You can't hear the play called in the huddle. You can't hear when the referee blows the play dead. And you're an offensive player, you can't hear the footsteps of the defensive player. And guess what? He was the star of his high school football team. And you probably gathered by now where he went to college. UCLA. And he went to UCLA, and he said, well, you can't play at UCLA. You know, you're, that's college, that's D1, Division I. And he was one of the stars, he was a tailback of the UCLA football team. And he wanted to play in the NFL. He said, well, okay, that's a whole different talent level. You can't play in the NFL. You know, they're faster, um, you know, much more athletic in the NFL than they are in college. And he played for the Seahawks. What is he wearing, I'll give you a hint, on his ring finger? 
Super Bowl ring. Yes, he's, he's wearing a Super Bowl ring. And they asked him one day, they said, Derek, you, you've been told your whole life you can't play football. You, you can't play football, you know, and because you're deaf. And you were told that your whole life you now have a Super Bowl ring. What did you think when everybody told you that? And he smiled, and he smiled again. He said, I couldn't hear him. <laughs> I couldn't hear him. So the reason I bring it up, in, in healthcare, we sometimes say delivering the best quality of care that's affordable and a great patient experience, that's really hard. And it, it is hard, but I think, and, and we, we hear it, but I think we can do it, and I think we can achieve it, and I think through human caring, through doctors and, and, and listening to patients and, and having empathy and computerizing the information, we can deliver and will deliver much better care in the future. I thank you very much for your attention. Our first question. Anybody have a question? <laughs> All right, down front. Hank, we got we, we have a customer down front. Good talk, Doctor. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Immensely. Thank you. Um, doctor, um, we hear a lot about Watson, the computer. Has that uh, been involved with Cedar Sinai at all? We, um, the Cancer Center has done a little bit of work on it. Let me tell you where Watson, I think, has the greatest short-term promise. And, and um, Watson uh, is good at reading uh, patterns, pattern information, and I, I don't mean to oversimplify. I think if people for, from IBM were here, they would uh, give a appropriately a much more expansive vision of what Watson is today and will be in the future. But for example, X-rays. Okay, that's really patterns, right? I mean, reading an x-ray, it's patterns. You look at an x-ray, it's patterns. So Watson will be sitting, I've been told, for the radiology boards. And, and it's true. I mean, you think about it. So is it possible that Watson could read an x-ray as well as a radiologist? I don't know. It, it's possible. There was a study showing that if we um, look into the retina, you know, you know when you go into the doctor and they point that light at you and, and dilate your eye and, and they're looking at your retina and they do these retinal exams, looking for what's called diabetic retinopathy, that machine learning in programs like Watson can do a better job than ophthalmologists. What about pathologists with slides? That's pattern recognition, right? Could machine learning algorithms, similar to Watson, do as good a job one day as pathologists? I don't know. These are all interesting questions. So I think what you see are fields, particularly, that have pattern recognition, um, uh, that uh, programs like Watson that have machine learning are, are likely to improve care. Great question. Thank you. Um, going back to one of your very first slides and looking for correlation, are the Europeans and the other, uh, you know, Western countries that much better at evidence-based medicine than we are? Is that one of the reasons for the difference in the results and our and the cost? Yeah, um, another really good question. I don't think they're better than us. I think we're all learning this together. So I've, I've been to the European countries. I think part of it might be the amount we spend on medicine, the proportion versus the social determinants of care. So those proportions were significantly different in the United States as they are in Europe. I think we're learning to get better in evidence-based medicine. The European countries are getting better. We're all going to be much better three years, five years from now. But I, I think, I can't prove that, but there's certainly a correlation between those ratios and the outcomes that, that people achieve. Thank you for your uh, talk. I thought you did very well. I loved it. 
couple, uh, question. Can you hear me? Oh yeah, there you are. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't see you there. Um, it's been alleged that one of the two of the reasons we overtest with MRIs and CAT scans at all, uh, one of them is because of our concern of malpractice litigation, oh, and then the second one is um, there became a period of time some years ago, I guess, when physicians started investing in. Uh, these centers that did this kind of treatment, so there became a financial incentive also. Could you speak to those? Yeah, wow. It's a, it's a terif terrific question, or questions. So first, there, there undoubtedly, you know, as there, there, there very well may be um, medical legal reasons, uh, so-called defensive medicines that we do some tests, um, such as MRIs. But most of the in-depth analyses show it's lower uh, percentage of the number of uh, scans that are not helpful than we may have thought. So for example, states such as Texas and Indiana had tort reform, and they thought that defensive medicine would go away, and potentially unnecessary tests would go away, and they did not find that after uh, tort reform. The, the second question you, you asked, if, if I understand it correctly, is really about incentives. So if there are financial incentives to do testing, could that promote more testing? And um, that there, there are some data to support that belief. If you look at what Medicare is doing and the commercial insurers doing, what's called risk-based payments. So straight fee-for-service, and that, that my bridge example, is changing to um, fee-for-value, that you really we're gonna pay more for outcomes than just doing more of this and that. And so that is the federal government's way and commercial insurers' way of getting at in the incentive question. Thank you, terrific questions. A uh, question, the, the article from the uh, journal was four and a half years old. Yeah. What's happened in these last four and a half, five years? Yeah, yeah, you're right. So that means we now know what's gonna happen in 95 and a half years uh, from now, because that was 100 years. It has been tremendous progress in uh, computerized uh, decision support, I think more adoption of evidence-based medicine. I have an opportunity to talk to medical residents or physicians in training and medical students, and they really embrace the concept. So I think culturally you're, you're seeing greater use of evidence-based medicine. You now have widespread dissemination of the technology, this federal subsidy of $35 billion to help physicians and hospitals um, purchase and use the electronic health records. Decision support's becoming more sophisticated you now have um, machine learning, artificial intelligence, um, programs like Watson. So you, you're seeing a dramatic increase in the activity uh, and the progress in, in decision support and uh, evidence-based medicine. Good question. Uh, I have a question. Um, oh. Oh, whoops, sorry. There, there, Somebody else there, had a microphone. Are, That's confusing. There, there are studies that have shown that within different counties, for example, in Texas, the amount of open heart surgery is a function of the number of cardiologists practicing. Uh, and, and Medicare has fought with this, but I don't know how successful they've been. But given the fact that what you're proposing will to some extent uh, reduce the income of certain classes of doctors who would uh, have an incentive to otherwise perform surgery contrary to what your evidence medicine would show, how much resistance will you receive from the medical profession? Yeah, wow. Um, so what you're talking about is what's called supply-induced demand. There have been studies showing the more whatever it is, surgeons you have, the more surgeries that are performed. I, I think with the transition of payments, um, from uh, fee for service to uh, fee for value, that um, basically you're going to see more appropriate care and less potentially inappropriate care in the future. My guess is, just like any transformation, and healthcare is no exception, when, when in, in, and pardon me for a second, I'm going to call healthcare an industry. It's, 17, 18 percent of the gross domestic product. When any major industry is transformed, there are going to be p winners in the medical profession, people who are really good at 
providing high quality of care and an affordable cost and a great patient experience. And I think they're gonna do really well and their practices are gonna grow and their income's gonna grow. And there are gonna be people who don't do as well. So um, in, in this new world of healthcare and their incomes may decline as a result of it. So I, I think what I advise younger physicians who come to see me is say, the new world has changed just like the river moved. Focus on high quality, affordable care where your patients are delighted with your care, and I guarantee you, you're always going to do well. Thank you very much for your presentation, both content and uh, a, a terrific style. Uh, the data that you shared with us comparing the United States with the rest of the world, an interesting interpretation is to look at the rest of the world in terms of prenatal care, K-12 education, cognitive activity of the society because there's the doctor or health care provider and then the rest of us who are the consumers. But if we are deficient in terms of critical thinking, judgment, understanding words like probability, then we fail on the part of the patient and the technology can't somehow substitute for that. I'm looking at LA County and LA Unified School District where one out of every four high school kids don't finish. Mm -hmm. And so that example compared to Finland or, or uh, Cuba or uh, South Korea puts us as a nation in a very vulnerable position. What do you think? I agree. Next, no, I, okay. no I, I, I think you're, what you're saying is absolutely right. And that's really the, the percentage, the correlation, social determinants of care. Um, we, we had the lowest of all the countries, I think it was 9%, <coughs> and that includes education. And, and um, so you're, you're absolutely right. One other thing that I left off is I've talked a lot about custom tailored information for physicians. The same could and should hold true for patients. So really with, um, okay, I have this genetic profile, this microbiome profile, I have um, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, I have breast cancer, and the same kind of information should be available to patients. This treatment with probabilities, you know, leads to the, the highest probability of you know, survival, um, excellent quality of life. So thank you for asking that. <clears throat> oh, thank you, doctor. Wait, 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 wait. We're, we're over here. Oh, okay. okay, thank you. No. I saw a YouTube vi video recently about a van that was going around Africa. It didn't need any electricity. It had an ultrasound and, and an iPhone and a nurse. And they would do surgery with a physician in the West, and they would be sending him scans from the ultrasound and pictures from the iPhone, and he would be directing the operation, and they were able to perform all kinds of medical operations in the bush in Africa. Is this technology that is being developed? Yes, no, uh, I, I, really important point, and I, I apologize for leaving that out. So telehealth is really what you're talking about. And um, it's being developed, uh, Africa, there are many parts of the United States that would benefit from it. And you know, the other part, what we're using it for is um, people are busy, you know, and it, it takes time to go to your doctor's office, right? And, and there's traffic and parking could cost money. So what about Skyping with your doctor? What about if you have a rash on your hand? Why don't you take a picture and, and uh, send it via email or text to your doctor? So all of these technologies are under development and, and being used. So we've done at Cedar sinai uh, televisits. We're using Skype-like technology, uh, talking to patients and, and diagnosing and treating them. What we call e-visits, visits over the internet. But you're right, um, uh, where I first saw well, I, I've seen this for an, a number of years, but about four years ago, um, I was at a, a game preserve in Botswana, and it was this remote part of Botswana where you take these little planes that seat six people and a couple of stops, and you don't see roads or anything like that. And one of the, the mo most fun parts of being in a game preserve, in addition to the, the animals, which are spectacular, is you get to talk to the people who live there. So they eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner with you. 
And uh, so I was talking to this woman, you know, at my table, and so we were talking about this, that. I said, I don't even know why. It's kind of a dumb question. You ever had malaria? And she said, Yeah. And um, you know, I thought in the United States of malaria, we'd, it would be grand rounds, and we'd have six doctors, and we'd be talking about it. And I said, "What'd you do?" And she said, "I had a self-diagnostic kit, so they, it was a you know almost like a you know blood test that she did herself on this game preserve because it was really remote, and all they had was a nurse who flew in. She never even saw a doctor, and she looked great." She was healthy and you know, was still working on the game preserve. So um, we're going to see a lot of these, you know, whether it's telehealth or home diagnostic kits um, that may not require as many physician services in the future. So thank you for bringing that up. Yes. I appreciated your thoughts on technology, but technology is one of the drivers of healthcare costs. So my question is, how much do you think that's going to add to the 17, 18% of GDP that you started uh, off telling us about? Yeah. Now, it, you know, let me tell you, technology can add the healthcare costs, but maybe not. So let's think about innovation and technology for a second, okay? You, you all have smartphones, right? I'm betting your smartphone has more computing power than some of the earliest mainframe computers, right? Yeah. Okay, it does. Does it cost less than the um, uh, earlier mainframe computers? It does, right? So if you think about innovation in technology, in general, do costs go up or do they go down? They usually go down, right? In, in most forms of technology. Um, they go down over time. You know, microprocessors, right? They got better, faster, and costs went down. So I'm not, I think as we innovate, I believe technology will enable us to deliver better quality of care at lower costs over time. And you know, to that point, you think about um, if I have a rash on my hand, do I, you know, and it's a weekend, do I want to brave the freeway traffic or would I prefer to use technology and take a picture with my smartphone and send it via a secure internet to my doctor? That's, that's probably lower cost. Okay, and much more convenient for me. So I think technology, there are places where it will increase costs, but I think if we do this right and innovate right, just like the rest of technology, it could drive down costs. Should drive down costs. Thank you. Good good question. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yes, Jan. I'd like to come back to incentives a little bit. You mentioned that um, insurance is, is moving from uh, fee-for-service, maybe looking more closely at outcomes. But I'm wondering if you were, say, going to set up a hospital, are, are some doctors still paid by salary? How would you set up incentives, pay for doctors, and in terms of organizing the hospital in such a way to take advantage of what you think can be done. You know, how would you organize it? Yeah, so, so there, there are different incentive models. So there are doctors, and more and more doctors are becoming employed by health systems. It's um, for a variety of reasons, and you see fewer physicians in private practice. And, and so, and in fact, if you talk to young graduates, fewer of them want to go into private practice, and more of them want to join employed models. But I think incentives are important and you would incent physicians and, and other providers on the behaviors that, that, that you want to incent. So it's gonna be on great quality of care. You want to incent them providing the best patient experience as defined by the patient, not by the doctor. And affordable or cost-effective care. So there are ways of doing that, of providing incentives, bonuses, to achieve whatever objectives you think is best for the patients, best for healthcare. A lot of formulas for that. Should, should we all have our genome mapped now in case we need it in an emergency? I, I'm sorry, I missed the beginning. Should we have our genome, our genes mapped now? Oh. So that we uh, have it if we need it in, a, in an emergency? Yeah, that's, that's gonna be um, a personal choice. Um, you know, that um, right now the application of it, we're, we're at the beginning, the first few steps. It's largely pharmacogenomics um, and, you know, which drugs you might interact with. And certain health systems are more sophisticated than others about how to actually use this information to decide drug A versus drug B. The other part that's interesting is if we map 
our genetic profiles, it turns out only about three to four percent of the information is actionable. So we might find right. that we have a increased probability of sudden death, okay, where a defibrillator, implantable defibrillator might make sense, or an increased chance of breast cancer, or ovarian cancer, so we may want to do more careful monitoring. But there may be things that we might find that we don't want to know. You, you know, we have an increased probability of developing Alzheimer's disease. And I, you know, I don't know about you, I don't think I'd want to know that myself. Um, maybe you would, maybe, it's all a personal preference and, you know, it might be half and half. So right now, I, I think we're on the precipice of this information becoming much more useful. I, I don't think I would run out and get genetic profiling, even though I did for our Labradoodle. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I think in the near future, I think this information will be very helpful. Thank you. Is it much? Hi. Uh, thank you so much. It was most informative. Fabulous. Um, every day we warned about medication, like this morning was, if you take ibuprofen, you're 30% more chance of risking stroke or part. If you take too much vitamin D, they found that people have been overdosing. Every single day there's an increasing invasion of drug promotion. People of all ages are listening to this. How dangerous is that and where do you see that going and why is it happening? It's to me, it's unconscionable. So. The, the, the amount of drug promotion. So, um, pharmaceutical companies, you know, certainly can promote uh, uh, information uh, on, on television, the radio, in in magazines. It's highly regulated, so they can't make uh, false claims. Um, you know, there, there's some people believe some people that maybe it'll lead to better care for some people that that you'll learn something and and oh, oh my gosh I should get checked for hypertension oh I have hypertension I should consider this drug and you know many people who also believe it could uh, lead to inappropriate uh, prescribing people going into their doctor's office asking for drugs that won't help them or might harm them um, I don't know the answer to that I think you know it, it's it's certainly uh, legal and and is and it's highly regulated, and which hopefully will protect all of us from from any kind of false claims. Um, but I don't know on balance whether it's more helpful or harmful. I don't know. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Uh, it was a great presentation, but I like to believe that this aimed mostly for doctors. Uh, now we have uh, doctors in the uh, private arena and pr doctors in HMO. They, uh, on the private side, they have all the incentive to prescribe more and to do more procedures. And on the HMO, just the opposite, to do less and scalp out less because, you know, to save money. So the question is, what kind of motivation or what kind of a plan is to regulate it in such a way that it will not happen? And us as, a pa as patients, how can we protect ourselves for either one of them? Yeah, yeah. Now, there's going to be convergence. So, if any of you heard of MACRA? So, MACRA is a new federal law that transform all of Medicare. And it turns out it's supported by the Democrats, it's supported by the Republicans. Uh, it passed overwhelmingly in the House and the Senate. And, um, and, um, and basically what it does for Medicare beneficiaries or payment to doctors for Medicare beneficiaries is it, it shifts care to risk-based payment based on quality and cost of care. So it's aligning, it's an attempt a bipartisan agreement, honest to God, to, um, to align incentives for physicians around what care will lead to the best quality and the best value for patients. So, you know, it, it's funny. There are a lot of things, obviously, that Democrats and Republicans disagree, largely related to coverage, um, coverage decisions. And, but the movement towards value-based care to align incentives with what's best for the American people, you'll find very few people who disagree with that. So, so the, I guess what I'm trying to say is, we were talking about HMOs over here before, and fee-for-service over here, it's all coming together in, in, in varying degrees. 
What year? Uh, 2019. <laughs> no, it's true. It's, no, I'm not making that up. That's the first year where um, all physicians who care for Medicare beneficiaries will have risk-based payments for Medicare patients, 2019. So around the corner, right? Yeah. Lincoln and I will be there. Yeah, yeah. There, there are two areas where I'm unfortunately familiar, which I think are appropriate for database medicine. Uh, one where perhaps it is uh, being introduced, the other where it needs to. The first area being dealing with what's now called CTE. Uh, we read about it regularly in the sports pages and obviously the NFL was believed enough in the studies to pay out a billion dollars mm -hmm. to those who had showed the signs, but unfortunately all of, a lot of the data has been derived post-mortem by studying the brains because the tests aren't adequate right now mm -hmm. for showing the damage. The other area where it's really necessary and which affects lots of people is the area of workers' compensation mm -hmm. because there you have a situation where the insurance company is incentivized to disregard the doctor's requests and bring, bring somebody in, an independent reviewer who's not reviewing any data. Mm -hmm. So if a system could be introduced to the legislators, uh, legislatures to require this, I think we'd have much more effective treatment of those in the workers' comp system. Any comments about either area? Oh, I agree. I, I, I think you bring up two excellent examples. I, I think evidence-based medicine would help. I think evidence-based medicine would help in most aspects of healthcare because if you think about it, the basic premise is trying to inform providers, including physicians and patients with the latest and most relevant evidence scientific evidence to help them make more informed and better patient care deci decisions that that will help virtually all aspects of healthcare workers compensation whatever it might be of but course then, two great examples then you have to uh, convert a lot of the uh, medical articles uh, professional articles into plain english so we the patients can understand what they're telling us yes yes and there are actually are efforts underway because I think a, a more informed patient is a better patient, and I believe it'll lead to better patient care. All right, we have to wrap it up. We're at the three o'clock mark. So let's give. Thank you. Thank you very much.